All right, we'll go ahead and get things started today. Thank you for joining us. My name is Nikki Fordingor, and I'll be the moderator in the briefing this afternoon. Um, please note that everyone should be muted unless they are speaking. Today, we're going to hear from Health and Welfare Director Dave Jepson, our special guest, Dr. Stephen Nemerson, who is the Chief Clinical Officer for St. Alphonse's Health System, State Epidemiologist Dr. Christine Hahn, and Public Health Administrator Elke Shatelik. With that, I will turn it over to Director Jepson. Well, thank you, Nikki, and welcome everyone to our press briefing on COVID-19 this afternoon. And a special thanks to Dr. Nemerson from St. Al's. We appreciate him joining us today. Crisis standards of care remain in effect statewide. The number of COVID-19 patients continues to exceed the healthcare resources available. And we see that in our hospitalization data. And Nikki, if you'll share that chart here for just a minute. Um, as a reminder, this shows the average daily census starting in June last year, and this data is all ages, including adults and children. The latest numbers are as of Saturday, October 9th. For this past week, we remained at very high, but slightly declining daily average census numbers. 704 COVID-19 patients on average in the hospital last week, down from the prior week, slightly down. 181 COVID-19 COVID patients on average in the ICU, uh, down from the previous high, and 127 COVID-19 patients on average on ventilators, slightly up from the prior week. All right, thank you, Nikki, for sharing that chart. Our, our healthcare professionals across the state continue to work very hard. Please take a moment this week to thank a healthcare worker that you know they deserve it and they deserve our respect and our thanks. We'd like to show our vaccinated versus not fully vaccinated chart and I'll give Nikki a second to bring that up. Uh, this data is from May 15th when everyone over 16 became eligible for the vaccine to Saturday, October 9th. This is the information on cases, hospitalizations, ICU stays and deaths from case investigations during that time and shows how many were vaccinated versus those not fully vaccinated. Uh, for reference, 52.9% of those 12 and older in Idaho have been fully vaccinated. And as you can see from this chart, this data remains relatively stable from week to week and has for many weeks now. We have 88% of COVID cases, 90% of Idaho COVID hospitalizations, 92% of Idaho COVID ICU stays, and 87% of COVID deaths are from those not fully vaccinated. All right, thank you, Nikki, for sharing that chart. As you can see from these numbers, the vaccine is effective and remains effective in particular against the Delta variant. For those that are unvaccinated, please consider choosing to get vaccinated. The vaccines work, they're safe and effective. In addition, please wear a mask indoors and in crowded outdoor spaces. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Nemerson. Thank you, Director Jepson, and thank you everyone for being here and helping us to continue to communicate accurate information to the general public. The work that you do is so important to the work that we do. Um, today, I'd like to share with you a bit of an update on the state of crisis standards of care, particularly as it affects St. Alphonse's health system. Then I'd like to talk a bit about moving from the concept of pandemic to endemic, and I'll explain more about that. And then finally, end talking about how to protect yourselves and how to stay healthy. With regard to crisis standards of care, for the first time in three months, we've finally seen a small decline in COVID spread in our communities. This is not universal across Idaho. And uh, while we are seeing this and it creates significant hope that we may finally have reached a peak, there is no guarantee that we've reached that point yet. Sadly, we continue to see a steady increase in ICU admissions and deaths. The vast majority of these, as we all know, are entirely preventable if only patients would become vaccinated. Intermittently, we continue to have patients boarding in our emergency departments in St. Alphonse's health system, and we run out of ICU staff and beds, both within our system and across Idaho. Our system is a tertiary care health system, meaning that we support every other 
hospital and health system in the state to try and ensure that patients can get access to the specialty care that only we can provide. And um, because of the fact that we're continuing to see this massive COVID surge, we can only service those patients that require urgent and emergent care. Similarly, we're continuing to operate within all of our facilities, particularly the two hospitals in Idaho, located in Nampa and in Boise, using non-conventional care delivery models, meaning that our healthcare teams are extended beyond anything that we would um, normally do. And similarly, we're providing care in both repurposed clinical spaces and non-clinical spaces. We also continue to see record numbers of both COVID and non-COVID patients. Currently about 40% of our total inpatient volume is related to COVID. But uh, as I mentioned, and particularly understanding that we're only delivering urgent and emergency care, uh, we're still seeing record numbers of patients that are sick without COVID. And in large part, that's due to the fact that now they don't have access to immediate acute care. And so only if they're getting more sick and they move to the front of the line are we able to take care of them. As I said, we've shut down all but medically necessary, excuse me, we've shut down all but medically necessary time sensitive procedures. And we're worried because patients are clearly experiencing harm due to the delays that we've had to impose. And indeed, we're sending some patients out of state to receive care, but they too are very full of COVID patients and high patient volume. Our specialty clinics in San Alfonso's health system have been reduced, in some cases closed, so that we can dedicate personnel to the care of acutely ill patients, and particularly those with COVID. And then the last thing to recognize is that our colleagues who are protected by the vaccine while they're experiencing lower rates of COVID than the general public and the intensity of illness that they um, have if they do contract COVID from a breakthrough infection, while they are protected by the vaccine, they're, being, um, they're experiencing trauma. They're experiencing physical and emotional stress and distress due to the fact that they're witnessing patients who are dying from this terrible disease unnecessarily. And that's what I want to talk to you about now, which is moving from the concept of pandemic, which is the unbridled spread of COVID, which does continue, to endemic, which is a recognition of the reality that COVID is with us to stay. On December 14th of 2020, I told you that that day was the D-Day in the battle against coronavirus. And sadly, today I'm here to tell you that we've lost the war, that COVID is here to stay. And the reason it is here to stay is because we cannot vaccinate enough of the public to fully eradicate the disease. And absent being able to do that and accomplish herd immunity, we now need to move into the phase of recognizing that COVID is gonna be a disease to be managed for the long-term future. Part of managing that then is managing the moral injury and the burnout and emotional trauma that our employees are experiencing from watching these unnecessary deaths, as I mentioned, from unvaccinated individuals. They continue to be harassed and even worse experience other kinds of uh, threats from patients and their families who fail to believe in COVID and um, worse, believe that we are not uh, committed to their well-being and their recovery, which we are. And so um, <clears throat> we within San Alfonso's health system have now elevated significantly our efforts towards driving resiliency and recovery of our own colleagues so that they can continue to serve the rest of humanity. The last thing that I want to touch on then is how to stay healthy um, for the general public and, and frankly for each of you, how to protect yourselves and your loved ones from COVID. Uh, and it's a repeat of the same message you've been hearing, which is vaccinate, mask, distance, and hand hygiene. But we recognize that with this Delta virus or Delta variant of COVID, that breakthrough infections will occur. They are extremely unlikely to result in serious illness or death in those who are vaccinated. 
but who wants to get sick? And we don't want you to get sick because frankly, we're trying to serve those who are unvaccinated and need us to save their lives. And so what we'd like you to do is if you choose to socialize with others, be careful who you choose to socialize with. They should have the same beliefs that you do in protecting themselves and establish social pods with those friends who you can trust. Secondly, socialize outside rather than indoors. We know that being outdoors uh, is healthy and um, disseminates the COVID virus if somebody happens to have it that doesn't have symptoms. Frequent businesses that are COVID safe. Don't attend concerts and large events, whether they're indoors or outdoors, uh, particularly in those events where the enforcement of vaccination and masking is not present. And then finally, now that we know that the immunity against COVID begins to wane with time, when you qualify for a booster dose of COVID vaccine, get it. And so with that information, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions for the end of our presentation, I appreciate, again, the time and opportunity to share with you. And I'd like to hand off to my colleague, I believe it's um, Dr. Hahn or Dr. Summer. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Nimerson. Um, and can you hear, hear me okay, everybody? We can, Dr. Hahn. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. I just wanted to provide a few uh, brief updates um, today. One is on our ongoing efforts to increase the use of monoclonal antibodies in the state. Um, certainly isn't going to get us out of this uh, pandemic, but it is going to hopefully help take some of the pressure off the hospitals and help keep some Idahoans healthier and safer and, and not in the hospital, even if they do come down with COVID. Um, so I'm pleased to, admit, to say that uh, Northern Idaho, we continue to see uh, an increase in the use uh, there. Um, the uh, the uh, governor's program um, has uh, th that uh, initiative there by Heritage Health has treated an additional um, over 100 patients since last week. Uh, in Eastern Idaho, Mountain View Hospital has also provided uh, over 200 um, uh, treatment courses since last week. So we're really pleased that those are going very strong. Here in the Treasure Valley, of course, we do have providers, including St. Al's, including St. Luke's, including some other providers that are offering uh, monoclonal antibodies, so it is available. Uh, but we are still working on finalizing um, a uh, state-funded, if you will, uh, an additional monoclonal antibody site. However, uh, as we um, allocate monoclonal antibody week by week, uh, we have been able to utilize all of the um, federally allocated product that has been give, given to Idaho, even though we're actually seeing a little bit of an increase week over week, uh, which we're very happy about. And this week, we actually had, the, for the first time, a, the third monoclonal antibody that was recently bought by the federal government is now available to the states, citrovimab. Um, and so we will uh, be working with the providers on the state to see um, who wants to, um, that has helped augment our total uh, doses, and we're hoping that we can get some providers to start using that. Um, and um, so we're pleased how things are moving forward. Again, my, my reminder I give every time, these are not vaccines. Um, they provide a passive short-term immunity um, that do help people not only recover from any current infection, but could provide some short-term protection protection from infection, but not long-lasting protection like the, uh, uh, the months or more that a primary series of vaccine will provide uh, and hopefully longer with boosters and so forth. So we do urge people not to consider these as an alternative. And the other reason is that that uh, monoclonal antibody may not be there when you need it. Uh, we know that uh, the supply, again, we're reliant on the, the doses given to us by the federal government. So we urge people to not uh, consider that their uh, their uh, number one way to pr protect themselves. The other thing I wanted to give a quick update on, uh, and most of you are aware, but just that Idaho is going to be very attuned to the uh, progress with the vaccines. And uh, one of them is uh, the advisory committee, the FDA's um, advisory committee that is meeting this Thursday and Friday. Um, I'll be uh, listening to as much of it as I can um, between other work and um, I'm very eager to hear discussions on two major areas. One is uh, the possible authorization of booster doses for Moderna and Johnson & Johnson vaccines, which of course 
Um, okay, those of us that did not get Pfizer are very eager to hear um, that development. Uh, so we may have an authorization for those uh, vaccines as early as uh, this Friday. Uh, and then we'll wait CDC to, to uh, create recommendations for those booster doses. Usually that's been a very fast, just a few days uh, type of uh, process. Secondly, uh, the FDA will be discussing the idea of, of what's commonly referred to as a mix and match. So if someone uh, received, let's say, one dose of Pfizer and for some reason their second dose was Moderna, can we consider those folks up to date or completely vaccinated, even though that's not a recommended uh, process? Uh, and uh, similarly, if someone got a primary series of one vaccine, could a boost, booster dose with the other vaccine uh, also provide protection. So that data will be discussed Thursday and Friday, and that will be very interesting and have a lot of impact on people who maybe not have gone the traditional route or may have gotten a mixed schedule. So uh, please, uh, we'll all be staying tuned for that, and we will incorporate uh, whatever uh, comes out of those meetings into our messaging, our programs, and our planning uh, moving forward. Uh, last point, of course, we're all eager to hear uh, what's going to happen with the 5 to 11-year-old children. We know that Pfizer has put in their application, and that meeting is set for October 26th. So that's just, gosh, that is coming up very soon. Uh, so uh, less than two weeks from now. So we're really hopeful that we will have an authorized vaccine, potentially from um, Pfizer for 5 to 11-year-olds, uh, which will be a potential game changer for schools, as now most school-age kids will be eligible for vaccination. Uh, and we're hoping that will be incredibly helpful to us. We are already starting to plan for um, the rollout of that. It is a different a dosing, a different formulation than um, what's given to older children and to adults. So uh, there's a lot of planning going on around that. We do have folks in the immunization program going on if there's questions about that. Um, so with that, I think I'm turning it over to Elke Shaw Tullock, our administrator. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hahn and Director and Dr. Nemerson for your comments. We appreciate them. Uh, for you know, weeks and weeks now, you've heard from us and others continue to express our grave concerns about our healthcare capacity as people continue to become infected in the state. And the toll it has taken for almost two years now is tremendous. Uh, we're in crisis centers of care. We continue to see a mounting death toll. In addition, our schools are facing stress as evidenced by schools opening and closing and reopening in order to address COVID cases in school settings. And while you just heard that we may be seeing a stabilization in cases, we are still cautious about um, because, excuse me, because Halloween and many other holidays are right around the corner. And it's important for us that, to emphasize that we need to remain vigilant and diligent with our mitigation measures to ensure that people are um, not becoming in contact or continuing to flood, excuse me, our hospitals, and so we can keep our schools open. Idaho continues to have high community transmission of the virus. You can find a lot of information on our uh, coronavirus.idaho.gov data dashboard, as well as what you can see on the CDC website. Holidays and events where people gather are ripe for the spread of COVID as we know, particularly for those who are unvaccinated and especially for our young children. We continue to see the incidence rate among children ages zero to four increase. It's important we protect them and others during these events. To, to reiterate a few points that were made by Dr. Nemerson, some tips for safe holidays, holiday gatherings include getting COVID vaccine if you're eligible, wearing face coverings if you're in crowded environments, staying six feet apart from one another, move your events outdoors if possible, and if you can't be outdoors, increase the fresh, fresh air ventilation in indoor settings. And of course, always consider virtual events. If you're not feeling well, please get tested and please stay home. Halloween's in just a few weeks and trick-or-treating is fun, especially if, if everyone can stay safe. We encourage trick-or-treaters age two and older to wear a mask that covers our nose and mouth, reduce the risk of encountering someone who is ill. Find some fun and creative ways to incorporate those proper fitting masks into their costumes. And we're really encouraging parents and guardians to role model this behavior and wear a mask as well. If you are beyond the trick-or-treating phase, please follow our mitigation and risk reduction measures. Get vaccinated. Wear a mask in crowded environments. Stay home if you're sick and get tested. These are the same messages we keep saying. We know that, we, that, we know that they work, which is why we keep reiterating them. And with that, um, Nikki, I'll turn it back to you for our question and answer period. All right. Thanks, Elke. Mm -hmm. 
So we will now take questions from our media participants on the call here today. Please raise your hand in WebEx or type your questions into the chat area. And then when I say your name, uh, please unmute yourself and announce your name and media outlet before asking your question. And then remember to clear your hand when you're done so everybody gets a chance to um, ask a question. Today our first question is going to come from Melissa Davlin. Thanks, Nikki. Melissa Davlin with Idaho Public Television. I have so many questions uh, based on what you said, Dr. Nemerson, that we're entering an, an endemic phase of this. Um, looking forward, I realize you don't know what that might look like with different strains, but how is St. Alphonsus and the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare preparing for this reality in our future? And does that mean potentially going into crisis standards of care multiple times a year if we have multiple strains that have um, big spikes? What what does that reality look like? So let's all answer first and then I'll let the department answer for itself. Um, first of all, I want to give confidence to the state, to the public, um, to know that we have incredible coordination now across the state, championed by um, IDHW, the Office of Emergency Management, all of the health systems and providers that are involved. Uh, so we're fully prepared to develop whatever, excuse me, to um, accommodate whatever comes forward. Uh, as you say, it is entirely unpredictable at the present time because what we don't know is what strains will emerge as people continue to be unvaccinated um, and the disease continues to spread. Uh, what we do know, though, is that we expect to see surges periodically, and as they occur, hopefully they won't be as severe because uh, at least 50% of the public will be fully vaccinated. The question, of course, is, you know, how contagious and how deadly will the next variant that emerges become? Um, and the only thing I can tell you is that medical history suggests that, like with the flu, um, the more severe surges like we're experiencing right now are much, much less common. Um, but uh, nevertheless, there are episodes, at least on an annual basis, that we'll have to deal with. And then finally, I think you were asking about how St. Alphonsus itself is prepared. Um, I can tell you that we have no intention of standing down our incident command structure, which is the principal structure for responding in a moment's notice to any public health crisis, and we're in full um, gear, if you will, to continue to deal with this. My biggest concern, though, as I mentioned, is the stamina of our employees and those who are going to continue to care for their fellow man uh, as we go forward, because none of us are superhuman, and we all have a, a limit to how much work we're able to do and how much stress and um, despondency we're able to handle. And that's compounded by the fact that too many people are coming into our hospitals questioning what we do. Uh, one of my leaders said to me that her greatest relief just a week ago was when a patient said to her, you're the doctor, do what you think is best. And um, she broke into tears because it had been so long that she had heard somebody express that kind of confidence, meaning that too many people are not expressing that confidence and we need to hear them more. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nemerson, uh, for addressing that. And from the department standpoint, certainly I'm going to echo what Dr. Nemerson said about continuing to make sure that we're prepared, we're supporting hospitals. I feel we've, we've built a really good um, relationship, and to include in the, the list of relationships that Dr. Nemerson mentioned is also the Idaho Hospital Association. Um, really working together as a, a great collaborative team so we have that good foundation from what we're experiencing now. But I do would like to ask Dr. Hahn if she... Uh, would maybe elaborate a little bit more on the, the change from pandemic to endemic and what that means from a state epidemiology um, epidemiologist perspective. Yeah, hey, thank you, Elke. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, a lot of analogies are made often to influenza, and I think that's the best way to consider as we, you know, as Dr. Nemerson alluded to, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of experts now feel that we are probably um, you know, this virus is not going to go away. Uh, remember, viruses surprise, you know, one thing, one thing we've learned is we do not understand this virus fully and there, it will continue to surprise us. 
but it doesn't appear likely uh, that it's going to go away. It is very likely going to continue to circulate. Uh, and we can only hope that over time it uh, becomes a milder and more um, tolerable virus, if you will, kind of like uh, um, some of the other seasonal coronaviruses um, are now. Uh, that said, um, especially if it turns into a winter respiratory virus, it's going to add on to our annual flu outbreaks and other respiratory outbreaks, and we may find ourselves facing um, more shortages or critical times. And, of course, as a department, we will follow the hospitals as far as what they need and support them to try to keep them, you know, functioning and, and uh, of course, working to, by educating the public to prevent uh, outbreaks as best we can. But, yeah, the transition, if you will, um, you know, I always uh, think about the fact that that 1918 pandemic, the very, very severe pandemic, uh, influenza pandemic, that that virus is, the descendants of that virus is still with us. It is one of the influenza strains that circulates to this day. So that virus never went away, um, and it is very possible that we'll end up in the same position with the coronavirus, as Dr. Nemerson alluded to. All right, we'll move on to our next question. We've got several lined up here, um, and that's going to come from Audrey Dutton. Nikki, I think that's who just asked the last question. I'm sorry. Okay. Can you all hear me? There we go. Okay, thank you. There we go. <laughs> I'm juggling a few things here. Um, I'm wondering, there was a new preprint uh, paper that came out that talked about um, loss of primary caregivers, um, and it estimated that nearly 500 children in Idaho have lost a parent or other primary caregiver. Uh, I'm wondering if you can talk about that at all, uh, what you're hearing and seeing, um, and this was only through June, so it was before the Delta variant you know, brought on as many deaths as we've seen and um, some younger people's deaths as well. Um, I don't know who to direct this to, so <laughs> maybe I'll keep. Yeah, thanks, Audrey. That's, that's one of my jobs on this call is to make sure I feel it's the right place. Um, I am not deeply familiar with the paper that you're talking about. Um, I saw sort of a high level um, version of something related to that, but I'm going to see if uh, Dr. Turner um, might want to address that question. Um, so, Audrey, um, is your question really about numbers or what the department's plans are to address the fact that we've got children who have lost parents? I just want to make clear what you're asking. And if you're talking, we can't hear you, Audrey, so sorry. How about now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, can't, could you address both of those? Yeah, so um, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll, um, I'll address the um, numbers part of it, and then I'll probably kick it back to Elke or, or the director to talk about, um, you know, the impact on um, children's well-being as a result of the loss of caregivers, parents, or, or um, um, the people that are that are caring for caring for them, like grandparents. Um, what we are seeing, and I don't think this should be any surprise, is we're seeing a younger population of people who are dying um, from COVID during this surge than we saw during the last surge. And when I say that, what I'm talking about is um, this time, if we look at deaths um, for this time of the year um, during the last year, 2020, we were seeing over half of the deaths were in people over, um, you know, um, 79, 80 and older. What we're seeing during this current um, phase of the pandemic is we're seeing much, much younger people dying. In fact, um, the majority of people who are dying are younger than 70 years of age. Um, and we're seeing a uh, almost a tripling in the percentage of deaths among people um, who are less than, than um, you know, 40. So, um, it's it should be no surprise to anybody that this is impacting um, parents of young children um, who um, may fall victim to um, to COVID. So we are seeing a younger 
a younger population dying and it is going to have an impact on on idols children and i'll kick it back to elke or the director to sort of talk about um children's well-being yeah thanks kathy and director do you want to add on to that um yes thank you thank you audrey it's a really important question and it's it's, it's a tragedy in those children's lives they lose a parent prematurely lose a parent um and I think we can all understand or have empathy with how um, how impactful that is to a family and particularly to a child that's uh, uh, to lose a parent. Uh, it's something that we worry about a great deal. Um, I think it's going to underscore uh, the importance of support systems uh, in those children's lives. And those support systems will need to be strong. And that starts with uh, immediate family members. Um, uh, both both immediately as well as uh, extended family members to support and, and surround those kids. Uh, certainly in the school environments, uh, that becomes critical to provide support for these children as they uh, spend their days at schools and, and helping them there. Uh, and then we um, really will need to be focused on how we continue to increase the behavioral health system in Idaho, particularly for children. Uh, just recently, the Idaho Behavioral Health Council uh, completed their strategic action plan um, Director Sarah Omenson from the courts and I are the co-chairs of that uh, council. Uh, and a, a large portion of that plan is focused on children. Um, there's also a large portion on adults. Uh, but it really feels uh, really important right now for many reasons, including this one we're talking about, uh, that we shore up the behavior health system that supports our kids. And uh, that plan is available on our website. Um, it has lots of things we need to do to shore up that system for children. All right. Thank you, Director Jepson. Our next question is going to come from Ian Stevenson. Thanks. This is Ian from the uh, Statesman. Uh, this is probably for Dr. Turner. Uh, a couple weeks ago, the modeling used by Health and Welfare uh, for future hospitalizations showed a peak of uh, 1,900, potentially 1,900 new COVID-19 hospitalizations over a period of a single week sometime in late November with peaks of around 2,100 cases in a week and 305 deaths um, around that time too. I wondered if there's been an update to that modeling since then and whether that's still a case or whether there's, there's new data or new projections there. Go ahead, Dr. Turner. Thanks, Elke. Um, thanks, Ian. Uh, the, the, the modeling is uh, being updated. We're still tracking um, pretty high, uh, the high end of the curve. However, um, as as many of you might be aware, um, our local, some of our local public health districts have um, been experiencing some difficulty keeping up with the number of lab reports coming in. And so case investigations are not being completed as quickly as uh, we would hope they would be. And so we're, we're roughly almost 9,000 lab reports um, in the red, so to speak. So our, um, Case counts are not really reflecting what they should be when we project them onto that um, that curve line. So one of the things that we are doing is um, offering assistance to our local public health districts to see if we can help them get caught up, so we can have a better idea of where we might be. Some of that, um, some of those reports have to be adjudicated in order to, you know, determine residency, whether or not they're even an Idaho resident. Um, duplicates, that sort of thing. So it's important that those be adjudicated and the state is um, is um, offering assistance to try to get them all up to speed. Um, so the, the long answer to your short question is that um, I'm hesitant to um, overlay our case counts on top of that projection at this point until we are more caught up on what our case counts actually are. Okay, thanks Dr. Turner. Our next question is going to come from Andy Sullivan. Hey, folks. Take, uh, thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, Ms. Shaw Tullett, could you give us an update on the funding for school testing, please? And uh, Mr. Nemerson, uh, wondering if you feel like you have been getting the financial resources you need from the state to fight this surge. Great. Yeah, thank you for the question, Andy. Um, we, for an update for the school testing monies that we have out there, um, remember we made available $30 million for schools and 53 schools or school districts have, pull this in front of me so I can look to the straight front, 53 schools or school districts have indicated interest in that funding 
Um, right now, we have funding in progress for 19 organizations. We do a subgrant process to the tune of about $4.3 million that's been requested. Um, funding has been declined by 13 of the organizations that only want access to testing kits. So we are working with contractors using that same pot of money to be able to um, purchase the test kits for schools. So we have a contract specific for schools to provide vault test kits. And we have $10 million that has been um, allocated towards providing those test kits. So we've ordered over 25,000 kits um, this last week. And then also because the schools are really looking for more timely results than the vault test kits can provide because those are a longer PCR test, um, our Idaho Bureau of Laboratories, and Dr. Ball is on as well, can expand upon this further, um, but they are looking at some contracts with vendors that can provide more rapid test kits. For example, some uh, Kaidel, Sophia test kits, uh, Q, which is a PCR-based shorter-term test, um, and some, some other options. So that's the update on the school-based testing. And then the rest of your question was for Dr. Nemerson, if you'd like to address that about um, funding uh, made available to hospitals. Yeah, and if, if we could, before we do that quickly, could you explain why it is important for schools to do these tests? What, what, what's the role here? Uh, are, are you heartened by these numbers? This doesn't look like there's many more school districts than we had a few weeks ago, right? Um, great comment, and I, I will have Dr. Turner kind of round this out as well, but certainly um, you know, we want to make, I don't want this to indicate that schools aren't interested. Many schools already had things in play, schools and school districts, and didn't need to take advantage of the money that's available. So they already had, you know, working, they were already working with some local vendors, for example, uh, to provide testing. Certainly testing is incredibly important and we keep emphasizing the need for testing to make sure we're identifying cases quickly um, so they can swiftly be um, addressed to make sure that there's not further spread in the school setting. So um, Dr. Turner, if you have anything else that you want to add. Um, thanks, Elke. Uh, the only thing I would add is that is to just reiterate that there are schools that are already already had programs in place using other sources of funds. And um, we also have some schools who um, are would like to implement a testing program and may need to seek um, permission from their boards um, before they can, um, you know, take the funding for, for the planned implementation. So there's, there's multiple reasons why schools may not have jumped in, you know, all the way up to their neck so far, um, and we're just going to be here for those schools that do want to take advantage of the funding. Okay, thank you. And uh, for Dr. Nemerson, do you feel like you're getting the funding and the financial support you need from the state and other sources for dealing with this? Yes, Andy, we are. Um, okay. And i got to say I'm really grateful for the support the state's provided and also the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. Um, if it weren't for the personnel that we've been able to hire through the additional subsidies, because as everyone knows, there's demand across the entire United States. And so traveler caregivers can go anywhere they want to get jobs and the salaries and the subsidies that are being paid are just out of control. Um, without those subsidies, we wouldn't be able to serve the patients that we're serving right now. So we're incredibly grateful and it is sufficient at the present time. Great. Thank you, everybody. All right. Before we move on to the next question, I want to point out that uh, Director Jepson has included a link to the Idaho Behavioral Health Council in the chat. You can find the strategic action plan there that will outline some of the additional help for uh, children's mental well-being. Our next question is going to come from Rachel Cohen. Hi, this is Rachel from Boise State Public Radio. I think this question is for Director Jepson. Um, I was wondering if the department is aware of how many healthcare organizations are in crisis standards of care or have reached that point at some, at some point in the past month or so since mid-September. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. And um, Director, do you want to respond? Sure, thank you, Rachel. Excellent question. Um, you know, this is our first time going through crisis standards of care, and a lot of things that we thought how things would work didn't turn out to be how things actually work. Uh, and so 
We actually do not uh, track at a hospital level how many are, have, are officially in crisis standards of care or not. Uh, several hospitals have, have uh, on their own indicated when they reach that point, and St. Alice is one of those, for example. But we have many small critical access hospitals across the state, uh, and depending on their situation hour to hour, they can actually uh, move in and out of crisis standards of care. So if you're a small critical access hospital with you know, eight to 10 beds, uh, you could spend most of the day doing just fine, and then you have that one critical patient that comes in that you are having trouble getting transferred to a tertiary care that's beyond the level of service that you are equipped to handle, and that actually puts you into a crisis standards of care situation. Hopefully that patient gets transferred, and hopefully within a couple hours, and then that takes you back out. Uh, and so what we've found is that for most of the, particularly the critical access hospitals, it's very fluid. Uh, and so we do not uh, try to attempt um, kind of who's moving in and out of crisis standards of care to track that. What we do instead is we have, uh, and Dr. Nemerson mentioned this uh, in his comments, uh, we have a very robust daily um, and, uh, uh, process where we check in with literally every hospital in the state uh, to see how things are going and to coordinate resources. And we find that to be way more effective and way more important than trying to figure out who's officially in crisis standards of care way more important that we're finding out who has resource needs and how we solve those. Uh, and that's where we really spend our time with the hospitals across the state. Okay, thank you, Director Jepson. Um, our next question is gonna come from Elizabeth Hadley. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you for doing this and thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm not sure who to answer this, but I am just wondering, you know, are you noticing or feeling as though healthcare workers where they once had, were, were proud of their work and, you know, felt some accomplishment? Are you noticing that maybe they're not feeling that anymore or they don't want to, you know, advertise that they're working in healthcare? Like, I feel as though there's this divide between people these days in everything, in every part of our lives, and it shouldn't be that way. But, you know, especially in when in this where people are taking care of other people and now maybe this is something that they don't want to, you know, they're not feeling as they used to. Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. I would say yes as the immediate answer to your question. Um, you heard Dr. Nemerson mentioned it in the beginning, we're hearing that across the state from healthcare workers, just feeling a lot of fatigue, compassion fatigue, physical fatigue. And I, I want to make sure that we turn it back over to Dr. Nemerson because I think he, he really had some great points that he made in the very beginning that would be great to reiterate about how, how his um, staff are, are feeling right now and healthcare workers in St. Al's and others. Yeah, and I would say, first of all, that healthcare workers when they're on the job and they're working with their colleagues feel immense pride in the work that they're doing and that's manifest by the fact that they're taking voluntary sh extra shifts working hours they've never worked before um, and they're working under conditions they've never experienced before stretching the teams in ways that um, are very innovative but not what we would like to be doing and uh, caring for numbers of patients beyond any healthcare team to patient ratios that we've ever experienced before. And so there's tremendous pride in doing that and people should feel that way. And, um, and we encourage that. And indeed, within Santa Fonsa's health system, uh, this, this afternoon, in fact, we're going to have a WebEx amongst colleagues just to communicate their experiences and um, demonstrate the good things they've been doing for themselves and for their patients and also talk about the challenges and the distress that they're experiencing. But to your other point about um, when they're outside of our four walls, do they feel like they need to hide their occupation? Do they need to be concerned about their safety? In certain circumstances, absolutely. And I've heard story after story of colleagues being harassed by people in the parking lot. Um, I've heard other stories about going to social events where they are challenged by people who don't necessarily share the same set of beliefs that they do um, and how difficult that is and that some of our colleagues have chosen to simply not talk about what they do for a living as a result, particularly if they can predict that they're going to be in an environment where um, they're going to be challenged on that basis. 
It's a tragedy. Thanks, Dr. Emerson. Our next question is going to come from Hyatt Noramina. Hi, thank you. Um, this might be a question for Dr. Hahn. Uh, would, would someone be able to speak to the difference between um, COVID and some of the other viruses that have stuck with us over the years? Um, can we get a sense of how vaccination rates in COVID compared to uh, vaccination rates of other viruses that we have um, as we transition into it being an endemic over a pandemic? Um, and, and what other, what kinds of challenges that might present? That's a great Dr. Hahn question. Thank you. I, yeah, this is a, that's a great thought question. Um, you know, a couple of things to consider. Um, we have used vaccines to successfully eliminate, um, you know, some diseases, smallpox, of course, always being the flagship of that, um, that truly has been eliminated. But uh, most vaccines continue to be needed, and that's why the kids today don't get vaccinated against smallpox. Um, but most viruses um, and other uh, diseases that we control vaccines are not eliminated through vaccines. That's not usually uh, what they do for a couple of reasons. One is that sometimes they don't eliminate transmission and carriage, and we've found that certainly with uh, this COVID vaccines out right now that people can still acquire the infection even if they're fully vaccinated and can transmit. Um, so that doesn't bode well for it, for eliminating. Um, the other problem, of course, is as Dr. Nemerson alluded to er earlier, uh, we don't have everyone vaccinated that is eligible to be vaccinated, so we have a continued ability for the virus to circulate in the population. When we look at other, um, I, again, I'm going to go back to influenza a little bit, partly because it's influenza season, and every year we urge Idahoans to get vaccinated. And Idaho is one of the lowest in the, in the country as far as uh, our influenza vaccination rates uh, overall. Uh, you can go on CDC's FluView website and you can see the different state um, immunization rates and the general population. And uh, we're usually some down, down there in the 30-something percentile, percent, excuse me, not percentile, but percent. Um, and uh, it varies year to year, of course. Uh, and it varies depending on what age group you look at with our seniors being more likely to be vaccinated. Uh, but if flu is any sort of like a, something to look for us to look for, for guidance, um, we continue to struggle to get people to get their influenza vaccine. So it's a, it's a long, uh, complicated topic, but I would just say that um, the history of diseases in this country and the history of vaccination in the country uh, doesn't seem to be pointing us towards uh, this disease and this vaccine is going to be something that we can eliminate uh, like we did smallpox and like we almost have with polio, a vaccine, for example. So um, there are other diseases much more likely that we could potentially eliminate uh, than I think this, uh, this coronavirus. Thanks, Dr. Hahn. Our next question is going to come from Ariel Dreyer. Great. Thanks. This is Ariel with the Spokesman Review. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear Perfect. you. Perfect. Um, I've been covering what's happening in North Idaho as well, and I'm curious if hospitals are asking the department to extend the financial support for staffing into this winter and if that will be possible. And then at what point uh, do we think hospitals would be able to get out of crisis standards of care? Thank you. Thanks. I'll take the first part of that, and then I will uh, send the second half over to the director. But the first part of that is we have extended the funding available to hospitals in, uh, through the end of December, and we will continue to evaluate the need um, for extensions of the funding. Um, we are also working with our partners, the Idaho Office of Emergency Management, and our um, federal contract that we have to provide staffing support to evaluate as a request for assistance come in and to make sure that if if those requests have already been placed, for staff that's already been placed in healthcare settings, if that needs to be extended out longer than the original time frame, we're, we're making some of those requests. So for example, in North Idaho, um, we had our, our GSA contractor come in and help provide some staffing support. Department of Defense also provided staffing support. And the window of time for the initial deployment, <clears throat> excuse me, as it's coming to an end, we know that they are still operating in crisis standards of care. They still need that staffing support. So we continue to evaluate 
on a regular basis how long we need to extend that. And, um, you know, but many states are experiencing the same thing. So we do have some, some restrictions that may start applying in the near future. I don't know exactly what those are yet, but we have to be cautious about the fact that, that um, the federal uh, rules may not allow us to extend them into perpetuity. But we're making every effort to extend those as long as we can. But certainly we have funding that's extending into the end of December. And Director, if you have, um, would like to follow up on the crisis standards of care piece. Um, yeah, so I'll, uh, just a few comments on that. And I think that was uh, Ariel who made that, asked that question, so thank you. Um, the we all of us would like to get out of crisis standards of care as quickly as possible. Uh, none of us really wanted to be here in the first place. However, uh, what will drive that is really the situation that we have. And and as we've mentioned before, the the driver of why we're in crisis standards of care is we have too many COVID patients that have overwhelmed our healthcare resources. Uh, and so, what will take us out of crisis standards of care? is uh, when those things come back into balance. Um, and as you heard um, Dr. Nemerson talk at the beginning that we still have a large number of patients coming in, even with extra resources and many extra resources still exceeding those resources. And so that really will be driven by the number of cases coming back down, which, which we hope is soon. We don't know if that's soon, but we hope is soon. Um, and so we can get back to our normal standard of care across our hospital facilities. For a slightly more technical answer to that, we have on our website the crisis standard of care documents. It's on coronavirus.idaho.gov under resources. And in there essentially is a checklist of things that we've asked hospitals to use to, um, as we go into crisis standards of care. And what we'll look for to come out is that those things become unchecked, if you will. So um, if we have patients that are being treated in non-traditional areas, for example, uh, something we'll look for is that that goes back to something that's more normal or if we have nursing ratios that are stretched beyond the normal standard of care, we'd be looking for those to come back into normal. Uh, and I would just check to see if Dr. Nemerson has anything he wants to add about the uh, kind of how we know when we come out of crisis standards of care. Yes, Dr. Uh, you know, I think you've captured it entirely, but the way I like to put it within my own health system is it comes down to the very next patient. Can we take care of that patient the way that we used to? And when we are able to do that, then we'll be out of crisis standards of care, or at least back into contingency standards. And we're not there yet, and we're not even close. Okay, thank you, everyone. We're going to move on to our next question, and that's going to come from Kyle Fonenstiel. Thanks, Vicki. This is Kyle from the Post Register in Idaho Falls. So uh, I'm curious for when health officials will be able to say that we are on the downward slope from this surge. I know that case figures are out of whack right now uh, because of the backlogs and test result processing, um, but, but hospitalizations have been on the decline for a couple of weeks now. And, and last week you said uh, both uh, Director Jepson and Dr. Turner said that you weren't sure if this was the end of a peak. Um, I'm, I'm wondering at what point will you be able to tell if we've exited a peak uh, and, and how and why will you be able to tell that? Thanks, Kyle. I would I, I would like to use my phrase, we're cautiously optimistic that that's what we're seeing, but we also know that we uh, still have that backlog of uh, lab reports that need to get um, caught up. And Dr. Turner was talking about it earlier, so I will have her follow up. Thanks, Elke. <clears throat> Thanks for the question, Kyle. So I think one of the indicators that is the best way to determine how much virus is being um, circulating in the community is our um, percent positivity. And if you look at our percent positivity, it has declined for, you know, a little bit um, every week for the last three weeks. Um, I think, um, you know, like, like Elke said, cautiously optimistic. I think if I see a decline in the percent positivity again this week, I think our, um, I think we'll lean more towards we're optimistic. Um, it's it's hard to go week to week and determine a trend, but I think four weeks of declines would indicate to us that we may be on the downside. Thanks, Dr. Turner. Um, our next question is going to come from Kevin Richard. Okay, hi. This is Kevin Richard from Idaho Education News, and I wanted to ask you to look uh, down the road to the day when the vaccine is available to five to 11 year olds and what sort of uptake you're realistically expecting. Is it gonna be a lot like what we've seen with 12 to 17 year olds with 
low vaccination rates, kind of the slow, slow incremental uh, uptake, and a clear gulf between the vaccination rates for the kids and the adults, the 30 to 40 year olds. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. And I'm going to ask Sarah Leeds to take that question. Thank you, Elke. Um, I, I don't quite know how to answer that question. Um, we, I would echo the cautiously optimistic that it will be um, embraced by parents of 5 to 11-year-olds so that um, we can keep them protected from contracting COVID. Um, I think also being realistic of what we're seeing or what we've seen across the vaccination since we started is I think we'll probably see a you know a, a large um, uptake in the beginning and um, maybe perhaps waning um, after a few months. I, I certainly hope not. I hope I hope I hope parents will embrace this vaccine as a safe and effective one for children. Um, but you know, it, it's hard to say. I have not seen um, any any uh, survey data of parents in Idaho and their intentions about vaccinating. So um, short of that, um, I think we would just probably mirror, I'd say we would expect to mirror what we saw with adults. And just really, really quickly, does messaging change when you're talking about a vaccination for, for young children? Um, I, I think the messaging is really, especially for that age, geared toward the parents of children. And um, I, I don't, think it changes much. Um, we really want to make sure that, that parents understand that that um, when the FDA and the CDC um, review that data and and make sure and say that the benefit outweighs the risks, that it is a safe and effective vaccine, if that's what the data is telling us. Um, and just ensuring parents that that's, what's, that's what is being put out there. Okay. Thank you. Sarah, Dr. Emerson, if I could just tag on to that to say one thing, which is, you know, in our health system, we're one of the largest providers of pediatric care in the state um, through our outpatient clinics and our family medicine doctors and our pediatricians. And what we know for a fact is that parents' uh, decisions around health care is generally the most, most influenced by their physician and secondly, by their family and the people and friends that surround them. And so it's going to be incredibly important that we deliver positive messaging and consistent messaging through our physicians and the places where children receive care. And so in Santa Ponce's health system, we're already preparing for a communication campaign. I don't want to call it a marketing campaign because we're not selling soap here. We're selling well-being and we want to sell the truth and people have to be able to trust us, which I talked at length about the cynicism that's out there. Uh, and so we want to be in a position to deliver clear, strong messages that the vaccine is safe, it is effective, it will protect your child against the rare complications of COVID in children, including multi-organ uh, dysfunction syndrome, which can be deadly. Very, very rare, but who wants their child to be the one in 10,000 that dies? Um, and so we want to be very clear about that. And we also want to be clear about the fact that if you protect your child, you're protecting yourself and you're protecting grandpa and grandma and the other people that surround that child. Nikki, you're muted. There we go. Mute button. Mute issues. Oh, good grief. Um, I have a couple of questions from Audrey Dutton in the chat. They're both data related, so I'm going to go ahead and ask them back to back. Um, Dr. Turner would probably be the best person for these, and then Dr. Nemerson might want to um, jump in on the first one. Her first question is, if there's time, or I'm sorry, hospitalizations have decreased, but admissions remain high, what are the most likely reasons for this? Dr. Turner? Thanks, uh, um, Audrey, that's a good question. So um, as you know, the hospitalization census data is, this is how many people are in our hospital on a given day at a particular point in time. And then admissions are really what, what happened the day before. 
And it is very possible that you could have admissions sort of plateauing or even, you know, maybe going up a little bit and your total census declining um, as patients are discharged um, because they're recovering or they die um, who are hospitalized. So it is possible to have both of those things at the same time for a, for a given um, moment in time. Um, that's a data perspective. I'm going to turn, turn it on. I'm going to turn it over and and um, and to Elke to kind of facilitate the rest of that question. Well, Kathy, you're totally okay to go ahead and, and ask Dr. Emerson to. Oh, Dr. Emerson, go ahead. <laughs> I'll try to I'll try to give you a different perspective, which is the actual clinical operations uh, within a hospital. There's really three groups of patients now that we're seeing in our hospitals. The first are the non-COVID patients. And believe it or not, they tend to have the shortest stay these days because we're doing emergency and urgent care. We're attending to their needs quickly, and then hopefully we're getting them out of the hospital quickly. Um, and so that's the first group of patients. They can have an either an incredibly long stay because they've had massive complications that brought them into the hospital, or they have acute care needs that are rapidly addressed and they're out. And so I would suggest that that's in that group, uh, the predominant number. Then there's the patients that have COVID and there's two groups of those. The first are the ones who are gonna end up in our intensive care units and some of whom are gonna die. The duration of that illness from the time that they become symptomatic to the time that they either recover from critical care or they pass away can, is generally at least three weeks, sometimes measured in months. And so they have an incredibly long length of stay. And then um, you have the other patients who recover from their COVID without needing critical care. And they have a shorter length of stay, usually measured in a handful of days. So when you add those three groups together, that determines the overall average length of stay in our hospitals. And what we've seen in throughout the state and in my own system is we have these sort of, I'll call them uh, mini waves of patients where a group of them will be in the intensive care unit, will have an extremely long length of stay, some will pass away, some will recover and be discharged, and then we get a small amount of relief, if you will. And then patients come from the general medical surgical units and fill those bed spaces. And then, as I said, the other group of COVID patients that are having the shorter length of stay. So when you're Comparing the overall net effect, it's uh, ebb and flow, if you will, that we're seeing on any given day and really any given week. Thank you, Dr. Nemerson. Um, Audrey's second question is, are hospitals reporting the number of patients who had COVID-19 at any point in their hospitalization, or do their daily numbers only include patients who are actively on isolation that day? Dr. Turner. So, um, of course, it's complicated. So, um, Audrey, it depends on which data point you're talking about. I will tell you that if if you are referring to the data that's on our COVID-19 dashboard, which is um, the number of patients with um, suspected or confirmed um, COVID, that is anybody who is um, actively in isolation as if they had COVID. It might be that they're waiting for the, the laboratory test or people who have, who have confirmed that they do have, um, they do have COVID-19. Our ICU is people in the ICU with confirmed COVID. So they have a positive lab test for confirmed COVID and that's the same as our, our pediatric data. Now, if, if you're talking about a different variable that is in the um, HHS protect data. I'm I'm happy to talk with you. Maybe maybe we can talk offline, and I can go through the data dictionary with you on how they're supposed to be answering those questions. Thanks, Dr. Turner. Um, I have been given the green light to go a few minutes longer from uh, Director Jepson. So I see we have two uh, final questions: one from Melissa Davlin and one from Ian Stevenson. So we'll go ahead and start with uh, Melissa Davlin. Thanks, Nikki. I was wondering if anybody is keeping track of the 
threats made against healthcare workers or times that law enforcement has had to be called in the state as opposed to just a jurisdiction by jurisdiction or hospital by hospital level. And I was also wondering if anyone has been in touch with any of the nursing schools to find out if this is affecting recruitment for future uh, healthcare workers. Yeah, those are, are great questions, Melissa. Um, we do not, as health and welfare, are not tracking threats that we know of. Um, we, we hear things anecdotally, of course, about threats to hospitals and healthcare workers, but we are not tracking that information. Um, but I know that the hospitals are, we've talked about this, I believe, in the, the past on some of these calls. Um, through our emergency support functions through our Idaho Office of Emergency Management, we can support uh, hospitals if they need support with security measures, for example, and that's where Idaho State Police would be activated to help support that. That has not occurred yet, um, so to me that means that the um, hospitals around the state are able to manage those incidents um, that they're having uh, locally. So I don't know if um, anybody else has anything to add if they want to jump in, but I believe that's that's what we have right now is not any complete information. It's all anecdotal at this particular point in time. And can you please repeat the second half of your question? Yes, I, I was wondering if anyone has been in touch with anyone at ISU or any of the other uh, community colleges that train future healthcare workers and whether that's affecting um, recruitment. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry, I forgot the second half of your question. Uh, the, I think that's a, a great point. And again, we haven't heard of that being the case. There's lots of incentives for um, nurses to move into the work field. There's a lot of monetary incentive, as Dr. Nemerson talked about. Um, <clears throat> but. Dr. Neverson, I don't know if you had any experiences with that, but that's something we can certainly look into. Not a lot. The one thing I do know is medical school applications are up nationally, and uh, I do some work with the Idaho College of Osteopathic Medicine, and am aware that this entering class had the largest number of applicants in their history. Um, and that's being experienced universally across the country. A lot of people believe that that's because the passion that a lot of our younger adults feel to serve is being, um, they're starting to feel that that can be best served by uh, entering healthcare. And so we're really, really glad to be seeing that, but I can't speak to nursing specifically. All right, thank you. Our final question of the day comes from Ian Stevenson. Thanks. Um, this is sort of a follow up to Kyle's question, and I apologize. I don't mean to make anyone repeat themselves, but um, regarding what you were saying before, Dr. Turner, if I if I understood you correctly, I believe you were saying that um, in terms of projections for future cases um, or hospitalizations, you were hesitant to trust a model at the moment, given the issues that there are with the caseload data in the dashboard. Um, but I, I wondered if um, just because that 1900 November figure would be such a multifold increase over what we're seeing now. Do you still expect to see sort of t census numbers larger than um, what what we're seeing at the moment or what we saw at the end of September? And then I also wondered if perhaps Dr. Nemerson had thoughts on any modeling your hospital system has about what you're expecting seeing in the fall in terms of whether you're going to see more patients more patients at once than you've seen so far or not. Thanks, Ian. I'll have uh, Dr. Turner and then Dr. Nemerson. Thanks, Oki. Um, yeah, Ian, um, it, it's it's really hard when you're, the data that's going into the model is not what it should be. Um, so I, again, I, I hate to slam the door on you, but I'm going to hesitate to speculate um, about the projections at this point based on our case data that we're seeing. Um, it does look like our hospitalization data has gone down a little bit in the last few days, um, but our admissions are still not going down. So um, I'll just turn it over to Dr. Nemerson to talk about what he's seeing. Um, so I'm waiting for an update on our predictive modeling for this week, but as of the end of last week, we were predicting a peak 
of inpatient hospitalizations in my own health system occurring sometime in the beginning of November, meaning that we expected to be in a plateau phase through that point in time. Beyond that, it's impossible to predict. Okay, thanks everyone for your time today. Um, we'll go ahead and, and wrap it up for today. We are planning another media briefing next week, same time on Tuesday, October 19th. Um, thank you for joining us today.